Hariyam, everyone. We'll begin with an opening prayer and then we'll get started. Om. 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 Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahaviryam Karavavahai. Tejasvin Havadhi Tamas Tumavit Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Samasta Janakal Yane Nirtam Karunamayam Namami Chinmayam Devam Sadkurum Brahma Vitvaram Hello everyone. And welcome to our final book light um, uh, event by uh, our team, this coping with the challenges of 2020. Final one for the year. Of course, we have our discussion next week, but this is our final speaker series. And so tonight, before we get started, we have uh, a slight shift in our um, uh, speaker. We were supposed to have Science Creation Energy, who wasn't able to join us, but we'll have instead Brahmachayani Shubhani Ji. And I'll have a formal introduction for her, but first we'll have a bhajan. So I'll pass it off to our team for a bhajan. Atma Rama Nanda Ramana Atma Rama Nanda Ramana Achuta Keshava Hari Narayana Achuta Keshava Hari Narayana Bhava Bhaya Harana Vandita Charana Bhava Bhaya Harana Vandita Charana Ragukula Bhushana Rajivana Chana Ragukula Bhushana Rajivana Chana Adi Narayana Ananda Shayana Adi Narayana Ananda Shayana Sachidananda Satya Narayana Sachidananda Satya Narayana Atma Rama Ananda Ramana Atma Rama Ananda Ramana Ananda Ramana Ananda Ramana Thank you, Ashika, for that wonderful budget. Amraji, we'll be passing it on to another eager singer. So I yes. just did an invocation. Next will be Kartik mm -hmm. Savaragiri. Oh. oh, wait. Oh, wait, I have a quick question. Wait, I'm going to ask a question real quick. Sure, Karthik. Okay, so I had actually like three different like choices of song. I didn't know which one to choose from. Uh, like, um, would it be okay if I combined all three like into like a budget? I don't know how like long that's gonna take, but yeah, if that's okay with you guys. Let's keep it three or four minutes max. Okay, should I just choose one and then go for it or? Let's do, yeah, do your favorite one. But they're all in the same raga. Okay, okay, okay. All right, I'll, I'll do. Okay. Um, okay, I'll go for it. I'll just do. Uh, okay, I'll do the Devi one. No, okay, I'll, okay, I'll switch back. Uh, this one's called uh, Shiva Shankari Shivananda Lahari. Um, oh, Shiva Shankari. 
ಶಿವ ಶಂಕರಿ ಶಿವಾನಂದಲ ಹರಿ ಶಿವ ಶಂಕರಿ ಶಿವ ಶಂಕರಿ ಶಿವಾನಂದಲ ಹರಿ ಶಿವ ಶಂಕರಿ ಚಂದ್ರಕಲಾಧರಿ ಈಶ್ವರಿ ಚಂದ್ರಕಲಾಧರಿ ಈಶ್ವರಿ ಕರುಣಾಮೃತ ಮುಲು ಕುರಿಯುಜೇಯುಮ ಮನಸ್ಸು ಕರುಗತ ಮಹಿಮಧು ಪ್ರಭಾದೀನ ಪಾಲ ನಮೋ ಚೇತೆ ಶಿವ ಶಂಕರಿ ಶಿವಾನಂದಲ ಹರಿ ಶಿವ ಶಂಕರಿ ಶಿವಾನಂದಲ ಹರಿ ಶಿವ ಶಂಕರಿ ಶಿವಾನಂದಲ ಹರಿ ಶಿವ ಶಂಕರಿ See now by telling us that you have three different budgets now I want to hear them that's not very fair but we have to move on so thank you so much Karthik we really appreciate the bhajan thank you now I'll pass it over to Sahana to introduce Brahmachari Shubhani ji Hi am everyone I'd like to take a moment to introduce Shubhani ji Brahmachari Shubhani Chaitanya is the resident teacher at Chinmay Mission New York Born in Manila, bred in New York, and built in Bharat, she has grown through Chinmay Mission as a Balvihar child, a dynamic chick, and a graduate of the Youth Empowerment Program in India. Inspired by Pooja Gurudev, she completed the Vedanta course in Sandipani in 2016 and was posted to serve as the resident teacher in Chinmay Mission, New York, where she now conducts Balvihar chick and adult classes. Shubhani ji brings a natural wisdom and compassion to her classes. and has the unique ability to connect to all age levels. Shivani ji has also been our guide for this book light initiative that began in January of this year and we are very grateful to have her speak for us in our final satsang of the year. Hari Om. Thank you Sahana. Hari Om to everyone and uh, as Amar ji said, you know, today Swami Sarveshananda ji was supposed to speak um he is unable to do so but we really hope that he does come back and speak to all of us today's topic is staying balanced and at peace and this is a topic that's very dear to me because especially during these times this is one of the most important things that we ought to know as spiritual seekers When we think of what balance means usually we see an image that's a bunch of rocks on top of each other or we'll see somebody on a tightrope walking and staying steady or we'll even see someone on a bike or a unicycle staying really really grounded so when we think of balance it's someone who's steady someone who's harmonious someone who's grounded But what is the Vedantic meaning of balance? Pooja Gurudev very beautifully brings this out in self-enfoldment. He says that we have four personality levels. One is the physical, one is the emotional, one is the intellectual, and one is the spiritual. And these four personality levels in us are always going at each other. sometimes they're in harmony they're all together they're one sometimes they're going at each other for example a physical personality will say i want to eat that chocolate cake and the emotional part will say i should eat it because my friend made it for me and she'll feel really bad if i don't eat it and the intellectual one will say you're done you're done with food you don't need more to eat and the spiritual one will say that is not brahmacharya you are going against brahmacharya you shouldn't eat it so like this these kinds of things happen in our personality layers another one could be physically we have to get up early but the body is like no i want to rest in bed and mo- emotionally the mind is feeling so good and yes yes you deserve it you're a great person you deserve it and the intellect said no you have to get up you have to do work 
And the spiritual personality says, if you don't get up in time, you cannot do your sadhana. So like this, every day we have some kind of battle within us. This battle is called imbalance. When we do not have a battle, it's called balance. So what happens when we have battles within us, it becomes very hard to do anything because we're broken inside. We're broken inside and we feel regret. Oh, I shouldn't have done it. Or we feel guilt. Why did I do it? Or we even put ourselves down. Like, oh, when am I going to learn this lesson? So whenever there's a battle inside, we feel guilt. We feel regret. We, we don't like ourselves so much. And it becomes very hard to deal with the world when we are broken. But when we are balanced, when our four personality layers are all in one level, then it becomes so easy to face the world. And in fact, this is when we can enjoy life the most when we are balanced. So the question becomes, how do we get these four personalities integrated? How do we make them all harmonious? It all boils down to three questions that we have to ask ourselves. And these three questions are, what do I love? Who do I love? And why am I here? So the first question is, what do I love? This is actually a really important question that a seeker needs to reflect upon. Why? Because in my body level or my body personality, one of the strongest challenges that I face or that we all face is something called indiscipline. We set up a routine, we set up a schedule, but we're not able to follow. Sometimes we're able to follow, but we overdo it. Sometimes we underdo it, we just don't hit the mark. Sometimes we can do it for a certain amount of time, but then we drop it again and we become inconsistent. So what happens is there's a lot of indiscipline at the physical level. And the only way, or one of the most effective ways to bring this discipline together is called love, knowing what I love. What do you mean? There must be something that we all love dearly in our lives. It could be a passion, it could be an ideal, it could be a hobby, but it would be something that really fuels us and makes us alive and kicking. And this love would be so strong that it could make my life in order. It could change my life and make it come in order. And I'll give you an example. There is this um, woman, her name is Kalpana Chawla. And she is the first woman of Indian origin to go into space. Huh? And when she was very young and she was amidst her students, her classmates in Punjab, and people were drawing trees and butterflies and suns, she was drawing airplanes because she really wanted to fly. She, she wanted to be in space. People were doing projects on the ground and she wanted to put stars up in the ceiling of the classroom. People were going out to playgrounds on the weekend. She, there was an aviation club and she wanted to go up on the roof so she could watch planes fly. And her passion in life, her love was flying, was being up in the sky, was space. And so she, she told herself that no matter what happens, she is going to study and she's going to make it happen. And she applied to the engineering college of Punjab eventually. And she was the only girl, the only woman to apply in the aeronautical engineering department. And she actually did really well. Everyone was kind of shocked. Some people kind of tried to dissuade her, but she kept going and she kept pursuing her studies. She was an editor of the school paper. She even had a black belt in karate. She did all the things that she 
loved because she found what she loved and her life became so meaningful and disciplined. And later she even came to the US to pursue her master's degree. And she did fulfill her mission of going into space when she worked with NASA. And she went there twice. The first one was very, very successful. The second one, unfortunately, was the Columbia mission, wherein something happened in the space shuttle and therefore everyone in that particular shuttle, their lives were lost. Why I brought her story to you is that she was able to bring so much discipline, so much love, so much light in her life because she found out what she loved. And what we love, you know, many, many people will say, uh, does it only have to be one thing? The answer is yes. <laughs> it doesn't have to be one skill. You know, it doesn't have to be one skill like writing, reading, but it has to be one thing. Because in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna makes it very clear. There's just two kinds of people. One who has infinite goals and one who has the infinite as the goal. And who succeeds? The one who has the infinite as the goal. So the first question is find out what we love. And it doesn't have to be the infinite. That's the ideal love. It doesn't have to be the infinite. It can be anything. But when we find out what we love, it brings a sense of discipline and stability in our lives and our body personality, is it gets transformed. The second question is, who do we love? Hmm? And in our day and age, we all look up to different role models different people we want to be like, whether it could be a rock star or whether it could be an entrepreneur or a politician or a teacher, whoever it is, we admire people. And when we admire people, we, we want to follow them on Twitter and on Instagram. And we want to like them on Facebook. We want to read their articles. And if they're a rock star, we want to get to know their whole album and memorize the lyrics and sing the songs over and over again. And what happens is actually we become who we love. So when we love someone and we keep our minds on that person, we become like that person. But the important question to ask is, who is that person for us? Because if it's any regular person, any regular being, then what happens is we are limiting ourselves. When we love the limited, we become limited because any person is limited. They may be good in one field, but they're not good in all fields. They may be good for some time, but they're not good all the time. So they could be like one hit wonders that they're so amazing for some time. And then after that, they go down. Hmm? Or they could be do something completely unexpected that's against your thinking. So whenever we pick a person to love, what happens is we become limited because we're loving the limited. But when we pick God, goddess, a form of God or goddess to love, what happens is we become unlimited. Hmm? We can pick, and all of you know this, we pick an Ishta Devata, a form of God who's truly, truly dear to us, who has those certain qualities which we aspire to, or a form of God who we really connect with. And we love that God. How do you love that God? Just like when you love somebody you spend time with them, you send them all kinds of messages and check up on them. Same way to love God, we have to send God SMS messages. And those messages are called Japa. And but the messages will be the same again and again and again. It will be a mantra. And keep saying and saying that mantra as a practice of Japa. And that will build that love for God. So the second question is, who do I love? 
And when I love the infinite, I also become infinite. This will greatly align my mind. It will make my mind divine. Because right now, the main issue we all have is how to deal with the mind when it's sunk in so many different things around us. Well, when we connect it to the divine, we become divine. So when you look, when you step back and you look at these two things, what do I love and who do I love? They're really the same thing. They're really the same thing because who I love is God and God manifests as the world. What I love, whatever it is in the world that I love, whatever my passion is, that God alone manifests as the world. So then this aligns my personality, my body and mind are both in love and they're harmonious. Now, the third question is to ask ourselves is, why am I here? So the first two levels are, are a great, you know, when a seeker gets to these levels, it's really a great eye opener because your life becomes filled with joy. Your actions are always doing something that you're passionate about and you have a great connection to the divine being. Then, but life doesn't get fulfilled or harmonious there yet. We start to ask the question then, why am I here? And when we start to ask the question, why I am here, what we do is we inquire. We inquire into our lives and this is through study. What kind of study? Not the kind of study wherein we're looking at different articles every day on Google or on Facebook or on this book or on WhatsApp somebody sends me, not like that, but a systematic study every day for at least 10 minutes of a highly inspiring text. Or even it could be an audio. That is called inquiry. When I am systematically studying every day. So the process has to be systematic. The process has to be consistent. Not one day I'm doing it and the next day I leave it because I'm bored. And the study also should be reflective. Not that I just read it and then I put it aside. No, what did I read? Do I, re first of all, do I remember what I read? Can I say four or five points about what I read? And have I seen this connecting to anywhere else that I, or anything else that I've read about? And what point from this that I've read can I apply in my life here and now? And when I think about all of these things, that is called study. That's called a systematic, consistent, and reflective study. And what that study does is it lifts thinking of my mind. Because every day the mind is surrounded by trash. There's more than enough information out there. It's information overload. Everyone's bombarding us with so much stuff. And if we're not selective about what we put in the intellect, then we will never be able to think higher. So when I start studying, when I start inquiring as to why I am here, my purpose becomes very clear. Why am I here? I'm here to discover who I really am. And why do I want to discover who I really am? Because that is the seat of bliss. And every day what we're doing is just we want to be in bliss. We want to be happy. We wake up the time we want to wake up because we want to be happy. We eat the kinds of food that we, that we eat because we want to be happy. We meet the persons that we want to meet online because we want to be happy. So everything we want to do every day is because we want to be happy. But when I inquire deep into who I am, I realize that I am actually the source of happiness. I don't have to go run here and there for it. So these kind of revelations come and I have so much more clarity about my life. I have so much more clarity about why I'm living. What other revelations can come when we study? The first very powerful revelation, the beginning of Vedanta, is that I'm not the body. 
I'm not the body, that I have nothing to do with the body. It's actually something separate for me. It's something that I can see, something that I can observe, something that I can control. Therefore, it's separate from me. And so what happens is all of these insecurities that we feel will go. I'm too short. I'm too fat. I'm too thin. I'm too tall. You know, I don't like my ears. My hair's too long. My hair's too white. It's too curly. Uh, nobody liked my photograph. Nobody's really looking at me. No one's paying attention to me. All of these things, they just go out the window because we realize we're not the body and how much time we spend just obsessed with it. The whole entire industry, a whole entire industry is just made to look at the body. All the issues on race and gender is only about the body. So when I study, I get these revelations. When I don't study, I don't get these revelations. There's no room for them. So therefore, when I understand why I'm here, it gives me great clarity, great purpose of why I am in this world, only to get out of it. And this is where my intellectual and spiritual clarity is. So the first one saying, what do I love? That brings my body in order because it makes it very disciplined pursuing that kind of worship, that kind of work into the field where I love. The second question, who I love, brings my mind into harmony because I'm connected to something divine. And I realize that who I love is what I love. It's the same thing. And then the third part is why am I here? I am loving that divine. I am loving what I do. Why? because I'm preparing myself to go in deeper. And that is that intellectual and spiritual harmony. Like this, when all four are very clear, all four personality traits or personalities are very, very clear, I become balanced as a person. I become completely in harmony with myself. And when I become in harmony with myself, I'm no longer fighting with myself. I'm no longer broken inside and I'm no longer feeling regret or guilt or annoyed or insecure or self-doubt. I'm not feeling any of that. But what I am feeling is total integration, total balance. And this gives me the ability to face the world. When I have this sense of balance, sense of harmony, I can face anything in life. Puja Gurudev says, for an unprepared personality set, something could feel like a big crisis. Something so small could be like a crisis. Oh my God, SOS, this happened. But for a, a little bit more integrated personality, it would be a problem. There's a problem and we really need to fix it. But for a super integrated personality, everything becomes just a situation. It's just a situation. Something happens, you deal with it, and you let it go. And that being able to deal with it and let it go and consider it just a mere situation will bring us a great sense of peace. Mm -hmm. So, we started from what is balance. We went into the four layers of personality that we have. We went into three different questions of what balance is. And we said that when one becomes very balanced, one is at peace. Mm -hmm. So I think this much is all I have for you today. So if anybody has any questions, you can uh, message Amarji and uh, I'll be happy to answer if I need to answer. Mm -hmm.
Funny enough, you know, Shupaniji, uh, they can also just message you directly now because you're part of Book Light team. <laughs> uh, but yes, if you have any questions, please direct them my way or Shupaniji's way, and we'll make sure that those questions get asked. Um, I also want to take a moment uh, to thank Shupaniji, you know, uh, for stepping up and being able to take um, satsang for us this evening. Uh, we would have been very disappointed to not be able to cover this topic, you know? And we also want to make sure that we were still staying um, day by day, uh, each such song at the particular time. As a testament to you all, you know, we didn't want to delay the book light for any reason. And we want to keep this series going. So uh, thank you all uh, to all of you also for showing up as consistently as you have been. And it's for that reason that we were able to make sure that we found um, Shubhani Ji to be able to take this satsang for us. So if anyone has any questions now, please feel free to ask. A um, lot of information there. So. Um, I think Kartik has a question. Um, yes. Oh, we're allowed to ask questions right now. So Kartik, maybe you can message us on chat. Yes. Okay. I do have one from Mark and they are waiting. So Kartik, just privately message us. Okay. And we'll be able to ask that question. Okay. So in Q, first question we have Shubhaniji is from Markande. And the question is, what is the difference between loving something and desiring something? Hmm. Okay. So there's a difference between love and desiring something. When we desire something, you know, it could be a very temporary thing. It could be like, oh, you know, I want to have this right now, but uh, I don't want it after some time. So when it has that concept of desire, it has a very uh, shallow kind of uh, thing to it. That's, I could want it now, but after that, I don't want it anymore. It, think of anything that any, any gadget or anything that you bought that you were so, so excited to have it. But then after some time, you don't even know where it is in your house anymore. It's just lying there and getting dust on top of it. But when we love something, it is a much deeper element. And it's something that's much more permanent. It's a part of who we are. It's not something we can easily forget or let go of. So love is something much, much deeper than a superficial desire. Hmm? Is that clear? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, Shubhaniji. Um, I'll ask uh, Karthik's question to the best of my ability, but if there's anything to add in also, you can feel free to chime in. Uh, Shubhaniji, Shubhaniji mentioned three different questions to ask, right? But is there a fourth one that should be asked for the spirit to bring the spirit into order? So that why am I here is for both the intellect and the spirit, because it's the intellect that can inquire deeply into that question, but it's the spirit or the spiritual personality that gets the revelation to that question. Hmm? So the, the question is asked by the intellect, but the answer the intellect will not be able to grasp. The, the answer is only the spiritual part of your personality, only that can grasp. So that's why they are uh, together. Mm -hmm. hey. Nice question, Karthi. <laughs> There's one question here that was messaged to me. Um, shall I read it? Or... Mm. So uh, you mentioned taking up study in a systematic fashion. Do you have any advice on how to put that into practice? Um, study in a systematic fa fashion, yes. So as I said, Take up a text. So one that uh, really helped me, you know, when I was in my 20s, I was listening to Puja Gurudev's Bhagavad Gita. So you take any text and you study it every day, but at the same time, every day for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, listen or read and reflect. So it's not just that I read it and it's done and I move on to the next chapter. This is what many of us do. We read and then we move on to the next chapter. 
but cultivate this habit of being able to just think about a topic. You know, you sit there with your book or with your audio, whatever, sit and just think about it without any writing, without any gadget, without any phone, think about it. That is the transformational aspect. That's when it's gonna sink deep. It's not gonna sink deep when we read one chapter, two shlokas or whatever, it's not gonna sink deep. And if we listen to something, it's not gonna sink deep. But when we sit and just think about it, for a moment, you know, for a couple of minutes even, that's when it really hits you. Mm -hmm. So in, integrate that into one study. Okay. Shubhanji, an extension I wanted to add on to that question would be, um, when those shlokas or chapters are taken up, this thinking process, fine, we can do. But to then think a little bit deeper, more than that, sitting back, thinking about it. Oh, yeah, I agree. This is true. How do we go a little bit more deeply into this topic? More than just nodding our heads and saying, oh, this makes sense. Ah, okay. So there's a couple of questions we can ask ourselves, right? So one is, is this connected to something that I've studied before? Have I seen this before? Two is how can I, have I seen this kind of thing happen in my life? Have I seen it in my life before? Was it there, you know? Three is, now if, if this is what the verse says, how can I take it and bring it to my life? So if I have not seen it before, how can I take it and bring it to my life? If I have seen it before, how can I now bring it more into my life. So this, this part of connecting it to my life here and now, how do I do it with this verse? That, that is the part where we have to think about. Sometimes, you know, we, uh, when we have to talk brahmacharians and, and you know, sevaks, sometimes we think, okay, what example can I give people and all of, all of these things. But really what we want to think about is, how are we going to change our lives with this? Hmm? That's a really deep question to ask. So that's something to think about. Hmm? And you know, another thing also you can think about is what was the thought flow of the author? Why, why? There's something that I love to do when I read Guru Dev's because why did he put this chapter in the, <laughs> this chapter? This chapter? What is he thinking? What is the flow of it? And that's another way to think. Think about how the author is thinking. Then you can get access into their mind. So there's a lot of different ways that you can just sit and think. Hmm? All right. So one more question came. When we are in the midst of what we feel is a crisis problem, how can we remind ourselves to view it as a situation? There is this beautiful word in the Bhagavad Gita. It's called Udasina. Huh? What does it mean? Ut means above, asina, seated above. Why or how am I able to see everything as a situation when I'm seated above? So when something around me feels like a crisis or a problem, what does that mean? It means that my mind is below. My mind is sunk into nonsense things. That's why it's a crisis and a problem. But the minute that I lift my mind to something higher and I'm doing something higher with my mind, my mind is involved in something so deep and divine, that thing will be very, very small to me. So something appears big to you if your mind is in a very small place. But something will appear very small to you if your mind is in a very big divine place. So how to remind ourselves that it's a situation, put your mind in a very divine place and everything around you will seem very small. Very like, situation. Yeah. Okay. Well, another question now they're sending to me. 
How do you develop power of concentration to remember what you studied the day or even after a few hours when trying to think about it? It's a very good question. And the answer I will always give is japa, japa, japa. <laughs> japa will make you the super duper focused, concentrated person that you would want to be. Why? Because what is the problem with our minds is it keeps going away. Huh? It's here and then it keeps going away. It keeps going away. It keeps going away. And we don't know the habit of how to bring the mind back. We don't know that art. But Japa teaches us at that art of being able to bring the mind back, bring the mind back. Whenever it's wandering away, bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. Japa teaches us that art. So when we take up this sadhana, what happens is we're able to practice that art, not only at the seat of Japa, but even in study, hmm? even in when we're doing regular work. So start with that sadhana, and then it will deepen also in your study. Right? Okay. If there are no more questions, we can sit quietly also for some time. <laughs> Shubhaniji, perhaps we can also do uh, announcements um, because I, I love to make fun of the group, but it's so true every single time. There always ends up being questions afterwards, you know, they'll just come, they'll just hit. So why don't we transition into doing some announcements? And then if there's any other questions that come about, then we can do that. And if we still have the time remaining, then let's do uh, silence. So I'll pass it off to uh, Heymanth to announce a really cool initiative that the Booklight team is doing. Bam, everyone. Um, thank you, Shivani Ji, for an amazing, amazing lecture. Um, let me just share my screen one second. Um, um, can you all um, see my screen? Okay, so as we all know, you know, 2020 has been a pretty um, uh, crazy year. So uh, we've prepared, um, the Book Live team has prepared a very cool event for uh, January 11th, 2021, wherein um, it'll be a chick session where um, it'll be a series of chicks who will talk for about three minutes each on their reflections on 2020 in the form of either a speech, a song, a poem, basically any way that you would want. And, and the reflection will be a personal vision for the new year. So, you know, Booklight has been super strong this whole year. We've had amazing sessions this whole year with um, Swamins and Brahmacharians from um, US and India and name it. And so we want to kick off the new year in a really cool style. So uh, this is one way to, um, you know, share your reflections on 2020, share your reflections on how you would want 2021 to be and just a great way to kick off the new year. So um, as you can see, the link is right there. The link to register is, um, is provided for you right there. Um, we would request you though, to sign up by January 4th so that we can, you know, so that arranging things will be a bit easier for you. Uh, for, I'm sorry, so that arranging things will be a bit easier for the book light team. Um, so if there are any questions on this, um, feel free to reach out to the book light team. Uh, Sahana, do you have anything to add? No, that's it. Thank you, okay. Heman. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about this. And as you can see, it's aptly named New Beginnings. So, yeah, 2020, despite all the craziness, has definitely been a pretty cool year with all the book light sessions. So now let's make 2021 
even better. And what better way to kick it off than with a session like this? So, um, yeah, thanks to the Booklight team for coming up with this idea for organizing this. So we hope to see a lot of you register. And if you need any motivation, I've already registered. So hope that gets some of you to register too. Um, so yeah, that's it from me. How are you? <laughs> Thank you, Heymanth. Um, on that note, one reflection I will share as a Sevak of the mission, um, and I'm sure Shubhanji will also agree, that those who speak on reflections, so sometimes we'll call it teaching, or sometimes we'll call it, you know, an open mic, for example. Those who are able to share learn more than everyone else, you know, as we study and speak, because in order to be able to articulate our thoughts to convey them to everyone else, it requires one level of thinking on our part. So first and foremost, that this event should service yourself, right? A great way for us to be able to reflect on a challenging year, you know, this 2020. Second thing is, by sharing, not only will it be fruitful for yourself, but it will also be a great seva for other people. How? Because to hear about the other challenges that people might have had, to hear about the ways in which that we are dealing with said challenges was actually one of the topics we took during our last discussion, right? What is one way that you've been able to stay, you know, grounded during this time? So whatever reflections you might have had, whatever, um, you know, thing that you like to share, you'd be so surprised just at what widespread effect that can also have. So take this moment also as an opportunity to contribute, you know, doing a little bit of stay up by giving your own reflections. So please take a time, you know, if uh, this is our normal book like time, and instead it won't be, uh, us speaking, but rather you all speaking. Um, so now I'll hand it back over to Shubhani Ji. Uh, Shubhani Ji, do we have any other questions that have come in? I have one other one from our end, but it's not uh, strictly with the topic. So I would like to see if there's any others on your end. Um, there's one more here. I can answer this and then maybe I can answer that. Hmm. Um, how do we distinguish love from passion? For example, I'm passionate about several topics and issues and want to use my life to work towards each of them. So, you know, love, you can equate here to vision. Mm -hmm. So, and you can equate passion here to skill. So for example, I will, I'll give you my example. My love or vision is spirituality, right? Spirituality, to share spirituality. But I can do that through different things that I'm passionate about, through reflecting, through teaching, through writing, through reading. So I can integrate all of those skills, but maintain that one vision or that one love. Hmm? Then it becomes very easy. So you find that overarching thing for you, and then you put all your skills in it. And that, that way you're very clear. Otherwise, we will just be moving in so many different directions. We'll be confused. Our energy will be zapped and we won't go anywhere. Hmm? All right. Okay, Amarji, we can ask the next one. Hmm. So this uh, question was a little bit general, but it was, how do you deal with right and wrong in the raw form? How do you deal with right and wrong? And what I'll do is I'll also add in a little bit of an edit here. We can say right and wrong is like dharmic and adharmic. When we don't have a pocketbook of, you know, the Vedas with us, those things which are in Vedas are dharmic, how can we distinguish between whether or not something is dharmic or adharmic? Okay. So you, now you keep this formula for you. It is called smile formula. Hmm? You keep this formula. It's called smile formula. What is dharmic? Dharmic, it's that which makes you smile. What makes you smile? S means that which is shreyas. 
it is considered the path of good by those people who you look up to, by those dharmic people that you look up to, this de action or decision is considered shreyas. M means it benefits most. Most likely dharma is something that benefits most people. It's not something that suits the least amount of people. I means it's guided by the intellect. It's guided by clear thinking rather than instinct or impulse. We really objectively thought about it. L is it is long term. When we're taking up an action, when we're making a decision, it's for long term. It's not for short term. And E is it guides me towards evolution. It makes me evolve. So this way, when I see these certain factors, S-M-I-L-E, that make me smile, that will give me an insight into what is dharma. If at all I want just one indicator, that indicator will always be, what is it that is going to help me evolve? That is called dharma. Hmm? So that is a, a way. And, and in life, when I make a decision, Drop the lower, pick up the higher. That is dharmic. Okay. All right. Um, there's one more question here. My question is that I'm always at peace and more sattvic in environments like retreats or in a temple. I'm working on maintaining spirituality in the secular field, but I find it very hard to maintain that same peace in sattva. What is the best way? That only means one thing, that our sadhana is not strong enough. So the best way is to make our spiritual practices stronger. The stronger our tapas, the stronger our sadhana, the more oh, able we will be to be anywhere in any atmosphere. When our sadhana is not very strong, we tend to want to only be in sattvic atmosphere and we tend to limit ourselves to sattvic, sattvic atmospheres and we feel good in that. But when our sadhana becomes very, very strong, we can be in any atmosphere because we are sattva. We don't need sattva outside, we are sattva. So what happens is wherever we are, it takes up our sattva because our energy is so extremely high. So how to deal with this particular thing is I must make my sadhana very strong, very consistent and very disciplined so that I don't need to look for a sattvic environment. I become that sattvic environment. And wherever I go, it is sattvic. Hmm? Right? Okay. I think that's enough for today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think so too. Um, thank you again, Shubhani Ji, for um, taking satsang for us this evening. We really appreciate it. A lot of good nuggets here. You know, she's even giving you a, a formula for determining, you know, what things we ought to do. So you have to think, will this make me smile? Will this make others smile? And will it follow the formula? It's a great way to be able to practice that. Our next, uh, next meeting will be on December 21st, which will be a discussion for chicks only. And that will conclude our book light for 2020. How fast our year has gone by in book light. <laughs> um, we'll announce what is coming up next for 2021 um, shortly. That'll come to you soon. But first we'll have new beginnings on January 11th. So please be sure to sign up. Sahana has put it in the chat for us. It'll be the bit link, you know, slash uh, book light NB, right? For new beginnings. So please sign up. We would really appreciate your participation. And that I believe is all on our end. So we'll now conclude. Om. Purnamada, Purnamidam, Purnat, Purnamudachate, Purnasya, Purnamadaya, Purname Bhava Shishyate, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Ah.
हरि ओम श्री गुरुभ्यो नम हरि ओम हरि ओम एवरीवन वी सी यू नेक्स्ट वीक फॉर डिस्कशन